Thank you so much, Pastor. Good morning. The Lord bless you. I am uh, thrilled, as always, uh, to be with you. Uh, I consider it a great grace and a great honor to open the Word of the Lord. And I, I am always overwhelmed by the kind hospitality that all of you show me. And uh, especially your pastor. Pastor and sister are very kind and uh, very gracious uh, to me and with me. And so I thank them for allowing me to be with you. And, uh, and I'm, just, I'm just grateful. So let's, let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us, all right? Father, we come into your presence grateful for the grace that you have given us in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are grateful to be with you today because, Lord, you are the reason we exist. You're the reason we live. You're the reason we gather. You're the reason we serve. You're the reason and the hope of our glory. You are the reason for everything. And so, Lord, we come into this place that we might learn to grow in your grace and in your knowledge and that of your Son. So, Father, I ask humbly, I ask desperately that your anointing would rest upon us, that your precious Holy Spirit would help us to hear your word, Help us to understand your word. Help us to have the courage to obey your word. Help us to live a life that is honorable and expressing worship to you. Not just in the songs we sing, not just in the times that we're gathered in this house, but Lord, that our very existence would be an existence of worship, an existence of glorifying your Son. So Lord, uh, I pray that today you would be the great editor that the things that are important to be said to this congregation and those who might be hearing later would be what is, what is spoken. And Father, other thoughts that may not be what you're doing right now, would you please let those be set aside. For Father, these are your people. These are the sheep of your pasture. They need to hear your voice. So please grant that favor to them, to me, to us, that you, Lord Jesus, would be our great teacher and that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would just permeate the atmosphere of each heart and the atmosphere of this room. And we love you for this. We thank you for this because you're so kind and you're so gracious. And we give to you glory and honor in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said together, Amen, amen. and Amen. God bless you again. If you have your uh, notebook, we're going we're gonna to look at the first page just to reset the table from yesterday. And then we'll be going to page number 10 uh, in, in your book. But we're talking about uh, redemption and being redeemed. And our primary text this, uh, this week is going to be found in the passage of Ephesians that we began uh, yesterday. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7. In him, and this is part of Paul's theology, and I'll talk about it with a chart today a little bit. But we were in Adam biologically. That's that born of the flesh, okay? So we were in Adam and thus heirs of unrighteousness. Now the Pauline, Pauline meaning the, the, that which is the expression of the Apostle Paul. So the Pauline theology is that once we were in Adam by our biological nature, but now we are in Christ by our spiritual nature. This is what Jesus was referencing in John chapter 3 when he looked at Nicodemus and said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So we are born once of the flesh, sons and daughters of Adam. When we come into salvation, we are born again. This time, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And so the idea is that just as we were in Adam, now we are in Christ. And so in him, we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in keeping with the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Same verse, Passion Translation. Since we're now joined to Christ, we have been given the treasures of redemption by his blood, the total cancellation of our sins, all because of the cascading riches of his grace. This super abundant grace is already powerfully working in us, releasing within us all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. Same passage now in the New International Version. In Him we have redemption through His blood, 
the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, which he lavished on us. Again, lavished is not just having all that you need. It's not just having more than you need. It's having more than you will ever need. This is where your grace is in God and Christ Jesus our Savior. So the Lord defined his own purpose when he looked at Nicodemus in that passage in John 3 and said those famous words in verse 16. God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him shall not perish, come to destruction or be lost, but shall have eternal everlasting life. I didn't put it in your notes, but the very next verse, John 3, 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You were already condemned because you were in Adam. There's no reason to condemn you. You're condemned. That's a fact. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hallelujah. And so then Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew 20, 28, regarding again his redemptive mission, this is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not be served, and then to give away his life in exchange, say those two words with me, in exchange for the many who are held hostage. And so when the Lord went to Zacchaeus' house, the Bible says that once Zacchaeus came into salvation, Jesus looked and made a, made a profound statement. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to liberate the lost. And this is the idea of redemption, that God is seeking us. God is pursuing us. It is a misnomer of, of, of typical Christian altar calls where we, where we speak about, you know, we found the Lord. We did not find the Lord. The Lord was not lost. He found us. He came seeking you. He came searching for you. You can't get there from here. You can't find him on your own. You can't find him no matter how much you would seek him. If God chose to hide himself from all of us, he is forever hidden. But God has chosen. Hallelujah. God sent his son. 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 Hallelujah. And he's kept the Holy Spirit who is ever seeking and searching and drawing and convicting and delivering and liberating. Hallelujah. The mission of the Christ and thus the mission of the church is to seek and save. God is the pursuer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jesus said the Son of Man came to seek and to save, to seek and to liberate the lost. This is the language and this is the mission of redemption. And so I wanted to reset the table because last year we talked about having been redeemed, being purchased out of a debtor's prison and our enslavement to sin. We were sanctified, which means we've been set apart for holy use unto God. And we were justified. This was our conference last year. The declaring of a person to be righteous or just, it's legal terminology, that of signifying acquittal. So, whereas justification is this, is, is this judicial act, the, the guilty are being declared not guilty. The, 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 those who are guilty are being declared not guilty. And we spent a whole week talking about that. So this week, or this, this year and this week, we're talking about redemption. So redemption is not just the, 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 the sense of, of the guilty being declared not guilty. It is the grace of transformation. So God in his justice, God in his justice, you know, a merciful God might have mercy, but he can't pretend you didn't sin. That makes him a corrupt God. That means he lacks integrity. That means he is not holy. And people say, oh, I, 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 you know, I don't like the holiness of God. Oh, you better like the holiness of God. If God were not holy, 
If God were not righteous, let's put it another way. If God were unjust, what would happen to the universe? If God did not do the right thing all the time, what would happen to the universe? And if God allowed injustice, if God allowed sinfulness to have its little corner because, and this is kind of what we do, well, we're just being merciful, we're letting people get by. If God were to allow that, then that makes Him unjust. And we often want people's sins to be forgiven, particularly our own. But we're not really inclined that the other guy's sins are forgiven. I want my failures overlooked, but I don't necessarily want the rapist's failures overlooked. I don't necessarily want the murderer's failures overlooked, particularly if you happen to murder one of my children. I don't want the racist or the biggest failures, over, bigot failures overlooked. You see where I'm going with this? God, in His justice, could not overlook and pretend that sin wasn't there. Because sin extracts a cost on humanity and it extracts a cost on creation. The Bible says all of creation groans because of this failure. So God in his justice sent the innocent. God in his justice sent the righteous. God in his justice sent the perfect. God in his justice sent the holy to die for the unholy, to die for the wicked, to die for the guilty, so that all of his justice could be paid for in his son. That's how you are declared not guilty. It's not that your payment hasn't been made. It's not that your punishment hasn't been meted out. It has. It just hasn't been paid by you. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't been meted out upon you. You and I are deserving of hell. I, I, 37 years pastoral ministry, if I had a dollar for every time somebody says, well, I just want what's fair. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you do not. I just want what's coming to me, pastor. Oh, no, you don't. Because what's coming to you and what's coming to me and what's fair to you and what's fair to me is an eternity in hell. That's what my life deserves. That's the wages of my behavior. Wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't want what's coming to me. I want what's coming to Jesus. I want his righteousness. I want his mercy. So this is justification. God taking the innocent and declaring them guilty. God taking the innocent and declaring them the, the pure and declaring them impure. God making Jesus sin, a sin offering for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. It's the great exchange. God takes all of our corruption, all of our wickedness, all of our sinfulness, all of our antagonism, all of our frustration, all of our anguish, all the consequences of our failure, all the consequences of our behavior, everything that sin abounds in, pours it on Jesus Christ, kills it on the cross, and then buries it, and then resurrects the Son of God, triumphing over that, and then giving you His righteousness. God made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So justification, redemption, and sanctification are the three great benchmarks of salvation. But this process of redemption is not just the sense that you've been declared not guilty, it is the sense that God is transforming your life. That God is changing you. Redemption is that He is buying you out of that prison of sin, he is buying you out of that slavery of injustice. He is loosing into your life His mercy and His grace. And there are three steps to it. And these are in your notes. We talked about them yesterday, but I'm resetting the table right now. It's this idea of recovery, which means to rescue you, to ransom you. It is this concept then of restoring you, restoration. 
and then releasing you. We mentioned it yesterday. How many times can someone be taken out of jail only to go back in jail? How many times can we be taken out of... Let's just be really, really simple about it. You don't handle your money well, you end up in bankruptcy, you get out of bankruptcy seven years later or whatever it is, and then lo and behold, if you don't go back. How many of you have ever ripped up a credit card, those little plastic demons, only to have that thing come back? <laughs> Amen? The problem isn't the credit card. The problem is the credit guy. The person handling the credit card. The problem isn't the opportunity to sin. We live in a fallen world. The problem is that I'm prone to sin. Redemption isn't just that the Lord has purchased you and brought you and bought you. It is that he is restoring you to the purposes he has for you. What the world has lost, what humanity has lost in its wickedness and its sin, Christ has come to restore. It's not just that you are saved in this moment and ready for heaven. That's why we don't have a bunch of mini raptures every time somebody gets saved. God's got work for you to do here. So you were going here. Here, he arrested you, he saved you, he delivered you, he restored you. He's making you the man or the woman that he called you to be so that he can release you into the purposes of his kingdom and the ministry that he has designed for your life. That is what redemption looks like. It is the transformation of the human soul. It is to give you the mind of Christ. It is to give you the heart of grace. It is to give you the power of the infilling of the Holy Spirit so that you will be as Christ in this earth. Hallelujah. This is redemption. So, sister wanted me to run through this chart with you again, and I'm going to from last year, but because many of you don't, haven't seen it, the chart's on page 10. Now let me show you a little bit of how this works. All the answers... On the next few pages are right here on page 10. Okay, so if you, if you get, uh, get behind or anything of that nature, all the answers are there. But I'm going to walk through this with you because I want you to see in a macro way the plan of salvation, what God has done for us. Let me get to my own page 10. Remember I told you yesterday, I'm sorry, but I... Um, I don't have the same page numbers that you do because I can't. I can't see. <laughs> it's an embarrassing thing. I was at a friend's house and I thought they had, they had beans and rice and it turned out to be uh, cherries and something else that I couldn't know. And I, <laughs> now you laugh about that, but imagine once that hit my taste buds, how off it was. <laughs> I was expecting a really nice Mexican dish and ended up with something like a souffle. It was kind of terrible, but nevertheless. So let's walk through the plan of salvation. Number one in your notes is the eternal realm. This is the dwelling of God. Okay? God is eternal. Everyone say, I am. Okay? You and I see eternity in a linear fashion. We see was, is, and evermore shall be. Okay? And that's all right. We see, we see eternity as time without ending. That is eternal life for a, creation, for a created being. That's not eternity for the creator. You see... The Creator sees eternity and actually is dwelling in eternity. The Creator is not time without end. It's also time without beginning. That's far different than anything you and I experience. There has never been a time when God was not God. There's never been a time when God was not eternal. There's never been a time when God did not exist. The very first verse of scripture that my mother taught me when I was very, very young, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The psalmist said in Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. 
This means literally in the, in the Hebrew text, from vanishing point to vanishing point. So if I think back as far as I can think, if I go back in my mind as far as I can remember in, in, in historical evidence, if I think back to the time of Christ, if I think back to the time of Julius Caesar, if I think back to the time of Aristotle, I think back to the time of Alexander, I think back to the time of Moses, I think back to the time of Job, I think back to the time of the garden, I think back to the time of Adam and Eve, I think back to the time of creation. I try to imagine what it, the world was before creation or the universe was before creation. At some point, my mind hits a vanishing point. I can't think of anything else. You are God. You're there. And if I think ahead, as far as I can anticipate, the rest of my life, the rest of my journey, till the rapture of the church, till the great tribulation, till the millennial age, till the new heavens and the new earth, till uh, 10,000 years and we've only just begun. At some point out here, I can't think of anything else to anticipate. Vanishing point. You are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. C.S. Lewis talked about if you imagined a large sheet of paper that went in infinity this way, and infinity that way, and infinity this way, and infinity this way. That's the eternal nature of God. Now he said, draw a line on that piece of paper. That's time. That's beginning and end for you and I. That's all of humanity. Scientists sort of understand this because they deal with geologic time. And the eras are so huge. And they'll even tell you right now that, that humanity is a speck on that time. Well, from God's vantage point, we're far, more than, we're, we're far smaller than a speck. We're barely a breath. We're barely a vapor. We are here and we are gone. So before anything, there is God. He is the eternal. This is the abode of the kingdom of God. God dwells in eternity, and this is the kingdom's reign. Chart number two in your notes, number two on your, on your chart, number two in your notes, the answer is, is creation. At some point in time, the eternal God created. God, who is the good God, he creates the universe. And the Bible says in Genesis 1.31, it was very good. His order is one of righteousness, freedom, peace, joy, and truth. There's no sickness when he created. There's no disease when he created. There's no stress when he created. There's no anxiety when he created. There is no death when he created. In fact, there's only one law when he creates man. None of the failings that are now known were realized then. In fact, Revelation 4.11 says that it was for his pleasure that he created. But at some point when God had created all sorts of things, and now you guys get to see my horrible artwork, at some point he created man. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Dr. Bishop's got nothing on me right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now when God creates man, he makes him unique. So let's talk about this for a moment. Not only is the human being unique in its very nature, he and she are unique in the way that God created us. Okay? Consider this for a moment. When God created the universe, he speaks it into existence. Let there be light, there's light. Let there be this, there's this. His spirit broods over the face of the deep. He calls forth land out of the sea. He calls forth uh, animals. He calls forth fish. He calls forth birds. And all of this God does by speaking. It's almost if, if I could, you know, it's almost you imagine the Lord just sitting on his throne and, and it's the ultimate remote control. You know, I'll have some light, I'll have some land, I'll have some fish, I'll have some birds, I'll have some this, I'll have some that, okay? But when he makes man, he doesn't stand back and speak. When he makes man, he doesn't stay in heaven. When he makes man, he doesn't, he's not enthroned on high. When he makes man, he comes, he gets off of his throne, and he steps down onto the earth. 
And he doesn't just step onto the earth, but he gets down into the mud. And he begins to take this mud and he forms man, the scripture says. And he forms man out of the mud and he forms man out of the dirt and he creates this this image like a like a sculptor would create a, a, a statue and he creates this image out of the mud the creator who cannot be contained in time who cannot be contained in space not only does he fill the universe that's the omnipresence of God but the doctrine of the transcendence of God says that not only does he fill the universe he transcends the universe so he's larger than the universe but yet when he creates man he comes down and he sets foot and he gets on his hands and knees and he forms the man and then he breathes like someone giving CPR. He breathes into man mouth on mouth, mouth on nostril. The dirt got on his face. And he breathes the breath of life and the Bible says man becomes a living being. This is different. This is different. The angels have never seen this. The demons have never witnessed this. Creation doesn't know this. And he makes this man in his mirrored image. A reflection of the divine. And this man has real power and real authority. He takes this man and he begins to show him the animals. He says, what's their name? He doesn't tell the man what their names are. He says, you tell me what their names are. That's real authority. That's delegated authority. It's under God, it's by God, but it's real. It's genuine, authentic authority. The authority comes with this dynamic. It has to be in flow. The flow of grace. This is why Jesus was overcome by the faith of the centurion. Because he would say things like this to the Lord. When he asked him to come heal my servant, Jesus said, well, I'll go heal him now. He said, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. Just speak the word. I'm a man under authority. And I have authority. He understood the principle right there. And Jesus was astounded at his faith because in the beginning, this is how it works. A person under authority has authority. I'll say that again because we seem to have trouble with this in America today. A person under authority has authority. Adam had authority when he was under the authority of the Creator. And he had been given two things from God. A relationship with God and rulership under God. A relationship with God and rulership under God. So God looks at man and he, and he speaks in, in the majestic thing and he speaks in the, in the form of the Trinity and he says in verse 26 of Genesis 1, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, let them rule. Over the fish, the birds, the livestock, over all creation, over all creatures. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. And this is the other fascinating thing about the uniqueness of humanity's creation. Animals, fish, of course, the, 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 gender, the gender specificity is there in, 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 in creation. But in male and female, there is, there is the, the, the wholeness of the human being is the expression of the glory of God. It's not just God being expressed in the, in, the, in the male gender or in the female gender, like, I, like, a, like the ancient pagan gods. You had, you had male gender and female gender. No, 
The divine nature is best expressed in the, in the unity of the gender, in the unity and the expression of male and female. There is a uniqueness to the divine quality that can only be seen in fathers, but then there's another uniqueness of the divine quality that mothers best express. Let me give you an example of that. Raham. Hebrew word for mercy. Do you remember the story of Solomon and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the two prostitutes? Split the baby. The Bible says that the child's actual mother was filled with compassion, full of mercy. Raham is the word. That word literally means of the womb. Of the womb. There is an expression of the mercy of God that is seen in the maternal instinct of sisters. There's an expression in the other parts of the, of the mercy and righteousness of God that is best expressed in the prodigal's father who saw his son, made sure his son had a place to run home to. He wasn't away on business when his boy came over the hill. He wasn't on vacation. He was waiting. And when he saw his son coming toward him, he ran, which is what a patriarch in that day would never do. But Jesus is saying, but your great patriarch in heaven, when he sees you just do the slightest turn, runs to meet you in grace, runs to meet you in power, runs to meet you in redemption. My son who was dead is now alive. That which was lost is now found. And restoration, this is my son. This isn't a hired hand. This is my son. And in release, bring the ring. Bring the best robe. Let's have a party because this is redemption. But see, it's best expressed in all of humanity. Not just patriarchal, not just matriarchal. This is the uniqueness of our faith. This is the uniqueness of creation. The uniqueness of God. But the authority is real. And because the authority is real, the consequences of that authority are real. Number four in your notes, the fall. What takes place then is now suddenly... Humanity falls. Humanity falls because this authority is under authority, has authority, and because of the fall, this man chose to no longer be under authority. And because he chose no longer to be under authority, he lost authority. The ruler becomes a slave. Adam, the administrator of the earth, chooses to transgress against the sovereign of the universe. There's a uniqueness in Adam's case. Whereas in you and I, we, we sin because we're sinners. Adam didn't have a sin nature. He chose to disobey. He was not overcome by his flesh. He was not overwhelmed by the serpent. Remember, the serpent's under Adam's feet. Both literally and metaphysically. Satan has no authority over Adam. That serpent, we, we just read, God gave authority over all the beasts of the field, the animals of the earth. There, 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 it, it'd be like the pawn coming to the king. Adam chose, and what did he chose? He chose this. This is the issue. He chose to no longer be under authority. That's what he chose. It's not about the fruit. It's about who's going to rule. C.S. Lewis talked about this. He said when he wanted a spot in the universe that was just his. And God will not allow that. There is not one square inch of your life that God's going to allow you to rule in. 
There's not a closet you can go to. There's not a secret sin. There's not a place where you got the little, the little, the little bottle. There's not a little internet site where you can go and watch the pornography. There's not a little this or a little that. There's not a moment of anger. There's not a moment of, of lust. There's, not, there's no place God's going to let you rule. He's relentless. He's relentless. You only get to rule when you are under his rule. And so Adam, the most powerful being ever created, the most powerful being to ever walk on the earth, more powerful than the angels, more powerful than the demons, more powerful than the heavenly host. You and I don't run to understand how this being created in the image of God will have the power beyond all other beings at that moment in time. Until Jesus showed up, there was no one like Adam. And we don't know how long he was in the garden. But at some point in time, he chose not to be under authority. And that triggered the fall. And the consequences were disastrous. All of creation falls under the curse of sin. Genesis 3.17, cursed is the ground because of you. Romans 8, creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For all of creation is subject to frustration, not by its own choice. By Adam's choice. As a result of the fall, Adam forfeits his administrative ability. He forfeits his power. He forfeits his authority. He gives that in a very real sense to the dominion of darkness, the kingdom of the air, Ephesians 2.2, 2, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. How did he get that authority? God didn't give him that authority. Adam did. Adam gave him that authority. Jesus called him the prince of this world. So all of a sudden, because of this fall, there's something that's created right here. And it's called the temporal realm. Or temporary. It's another way to, to speak to it. In fact, on your chart, it's at the bottom. So I'm, I apologize, I put it in the wrong spot. So let me put it over here. The temporal realm is created. Time as we currently know it and understand it is created. This is the abode now of fallen man. This is where you and I live. We live here in this fallen place that is temporary and temporal. We have uh, 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 a lack of return. The abode of the dominion of darkness. Everything on earth is now temporary. Death and suffering, pain and disease, torment and sin, frustration and anxiety. All of these things are now marks of the temporary realm. God looks at Adam in Genesis 3.19 and he says, By the sweat of your brow. You will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, and for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So now man is destined once to die, and after that to face judgment. So chart number six in your notes and on, and, and, uh, and on the chart on page ten. Now you and I have received an inheritance. And that inheritance is an inheritance of sin. Due to the transgression of Adam, we're all guilty of sin. Due to the transgression of Adam, we've all received a fallen nature that's under the curse of death. By no act of transgression on your own, we became sinners. This is the doctrine of original sin that we spoke of yesterday and to a degree today. It is not the fact that I sin that has made me a sinner. I am a sinner, therefore I sin. It's the doctrine of original sin. I was in Adam when he transgressed, biologically. You were in Adam when he transgressed, biologically. In the same way that I re inherited skin color and eye color and body build and receding hairline and all these other things from somebody, we all inherited sin. And the consequences of it. None of us are getting out of here alive. 
unless the Lord returns before that. Sickness, death, disease, destruction, all of these things are part of sin. They're part of this fallen world. They're part of this fallen humanity. This is where you and I now live. This is what you and I are now walking in and walking through. So then you have in this moment, Romans 5, 12, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sin. But the beautiful thing, my friends, is that Ephesians 2, 4 says, God, who is rich in mercy. God who is rich in mercy. Chart number seven in, in your notes. There is a scarlet thread. And this scarlet thread is a thread, hallelujah, of redemption. Beginning in the garden, the Lord looks at the, at the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. This is what happens is that throughout the, all of eternity, or throughout all of time, you have this thread of redemption that runs through the course of the Old Testament. You have the lamb in the Old Testament. You have the Passover lamb. You have the picture of salvation. You have the picture of redemption. You have the picture in Isaiah that the Lord is your redeemer. You have Job facing onslaught in hell, crying out, I know my redeemer lives. You have the prophets looking toward the suffering servant. You have Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. By his stripes we are healed. See, my servant will lay his his life down. Hallelujah. You have Daniel prophesying about a time until Messiah comes, the prince comes, but then he will be cut off, but not for himself, but for the transgressions of my people. You have all of this prophetic utterance pointing to Jesus, and then John the Baptist sees Jesus one day, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So everything that Adam had done miserably in his failure, the second Adam Paul calls him. Jesus. Number eight in your notes, in your chart. The incarnation takes place. God himself becomes a man. God himself becomes a human being. The king himself sets foot on the stage of human history. Oh, my friends, can you imagine it? The eternal God without beginning, without ending, cannot be measured in time, cannot be measured in space, cannot be measured in body, cannot be measured in thought, cannot be described by the poet, cannot be understood by the scientist, cannot be described properly by the preacher. Oh, if I could tell you about him, he'd be limited to my vocabulary. If I could sing about him, he'd be limited to my song. If I could write books about him, he'd be limited to my books. But he's greater than all the knowledge. He's greater than all the creation. He's greater than all the universe. This God who cannot be contained in creation sets foot as a baby in a manger. No wonder the heavens sang. No wonder the shepherds ran, left their flocks and ran to see this. No wonder some Persian magi crossed over land and hill and sea because they'd seen a sign that he was coming. No wonder the enemy roared. No wonder the demons fought. No wonder Herod came looking to kill. No wonder all these beings came to destroy. But the Son of Man set foot on the stage of human history. And not only did he live a sinless life, he died a terrible, horrific, atoning death. But my friend, it wasn't just this idea that someone killed him because no one could kill him. He said, I lay down my life and I take it back up. Pontius Pilate, frustrated at the silence of Jesus, looked at him and said, don't you realize I have the power to crucify you or to set you free? And the lamb who was silent spoke. He said, you have no power over me. None. None. Christ became a man. Christ became part 
of this realm. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. Christ was tempted in all ways just as we are and yet without sin. Christ went to the cross. Christ suffered and died. God the Son put on a tent of clay and set foot on the stage of human history in the person of Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the last representative man, completely God and yet completely man, the perfect one. John described him this way in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life and that life was the light of men. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father. Full of grace and truth. God wants us to know that we are loved by Him. 1 John 4, 9. God showed His love for us. When he sent his only son into the world to give us life. The Apostle John assures us that the love of Christ is not abstract. It is not theoretical. It is not an academic exercise. It is not a philosophical description. It is not a poetic sonnet. It is a tangible reality. The only way for love to grow, the only way for love to be real, the only way for love to be understood is for it to be experienced. He did not come on a Friday or on a Thursday, die on a Friday, resurrect on a Sunday, and leave on Monday. You want to do the ministry of Jesus? You've got to be incarnational. You've got to step in where it's messy. You've got to step in to where it's broken. You've got to step in to where it's difficult. You've got to step in to the, where the AIDS patients are. You've got to step in where the prostitutes are broken. You've got to step in to where the drug addicts are dwelling. You've got to step in to where the alcoholics are hiding. You've got to step in to even where the criminals are lurking. You've got to step in to where the lost are. Are because your job is to seek and recover. You are heirs of redemption and called to the ministry of the redeemed. The love of God is incarnational. It's not philosophical. Don't get me wrong. It's wonderful to be in here and sing of the love of Jesus. It's wonderful to hear pastors speak of the love of Jesus. It's wonderful to have your friends talk about the love of Jesus. But real love, 1 John 4.10, real love isn't our love for God, but His love for us. God sent His Son to be the sacrifice by which our sins are forgiven. You see, my friends, Generosity is not measured by what you give. It's measured by how much you keep back. We have a wonderful sister in our church, in our campus, and she does a great ministry to the homeless folks. And what she does is, is they buy these, you, you, you guys, I don't, know if they, I don't know if you have them up here in Alaska, but you know what food, food trucks are? Mm -hmm. You know, go to construction sites. Well, Oakland's kind of famous for food trucks in that it's better than the restaurants in town. They're, I mean, it's really good. Um, you have TV shows where they come and talk about the food trucks in Oakland. Okay, that's just, just crazy. But she buys one of these and, or, or a couple of these and she'll, she'll take them into the places where the homeless are encamped and just feed them. Feed them that way, you know. And, um, and one of the ways she, she does it is large donors are able to do that. And there's, there's, there's a person that if I were to give you his name, you would, you would know him. In fact, most of you use his little app all the time. And 
he's not Christian by any stretch of the imagination, but, but he likes that kind of ministry and work. And, and so, in fact, I have pictures of our, of our uh, K through 12 students with, with this gentleman because he was helped feeding the homeless with them one day. So he buys one of these trucks. They're $180,000. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's a ton of money for me. If I were to give you $180,000 for that truck, I would be generous. You know why? Because that kind of wiped me out. In fact, I'd probably have to borrow it from somebody. I'd probably borrow it from Pastor or somebody. I'd borrow it. <laughs> but for this person, it's kind of the equivalent of me buying lunch. Because he's so vastly wealthy. It's what Jesus meant. He didn't rebuke the rich who gave an abundance because we thank the Lord for that. But he commended the woman who was the widow because she had given her all. Mm -hmm. They gave more, but they had more left. Mm -hmm. She gave all because she had nothing left. Jesus had nothing left. He didn't give a portion. He didn't give some. He gave all. He ascended, number nine. But I want you to hear me for a minute. And I don't want to get too theological with you, but I want you to hear this. Forever, He is the Lamb of God. Now think about that. This one, who Lewis talks about the dance of heaven and other authors, this Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this incredible being who could not be contained, this incredible being who could not be measured, this incredible being who could not be understood and by any character trait that you and I could have described. We're not smart enough, bright enough, artistic enough, brilliant enough, or anything enough to properly describe this holy God, this one, this Lord Jesus. But now, and for all eternity, he is the Lamb. When John describes the throne in heaven, he says the throne of God was there and of the Lamb. Forever now, you and I can identify with God, not just because he's God, but because he's human. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he doesn't stop being human. He is the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life. But don't you dare diminish it to some easy, simple task, to some easy three-day thing. Well, lots of people have suffered. Lots of people have been crucified. Lots of people have taken weighty matters. Oh, no, my friend. Forever he is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. You will see him by his wounds. He self-identified. By his brokenness, you will behold him. You will know it's Jesus. And it is Jesus who gave his life for you and forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever you will be able to touch him you will be able to hold him you will be able to look upon him you will be able to sit with him on his throne he said because he gave it all he held nothing back we think Oh, he gave up eternity for 33 years. What's the big deal? Are you kidding me? No. No. He stepped into time. He stepped into a body. He stepped into a world that was corrupt. He stepped into the brokenness of your life and my life. And so it wasn't just 2,000 years ago. But he's the incarnate Christ. He's the ascended Lord. He's seated high and lifted up. But he has sent his mighty Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And he is stepping into, through his spirit, he steps into your life. 
He steps into your brokenness. He steps into your failure. He steps into your pain. He steps into your suffering. He steps into your addiction. He steps into your failure. He steps into your wickedness. He steps into your corruption. And he begins to move and mold and shape and redeem. Always. Number 10 is the indwelling spirit. Number 11 is the church. So all of human history now is summed up in the genealogies of these two men. Adam, our biological father, who gave us the inheritance of sin. He came to a perfect world and brought destruction. And Jesus, who came as the second Adam, the last representative man, he came into a world of chaos and brought heaven, the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. In Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam a life-giving spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. God's justice demanded our death. His mercy demanded our life. Jesus and his cross was the answer, the necessary work for merging the eternity of God with the temporal realm. It was God who became man and Jesus Christ went to the cross. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. Hallelujah. He ascended upon high. He demonstrated the power of God over sin and its byproducts of death and hell. He purchased us unto the Father. He is alive. He is well. He has taken and disarmed the powers and authorities of darkness. He said to John in Revelation 1, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and of Hades. He sent his spirit To create the church. I serve in Oakland. Oakland is probably I'm trying to remember the ranking. It's either in the, it's, in, it's certainly in the top five. I'm thinking it's top one or two or three. Most ethnically diverse cities in not just America, in the world. At last count, 168 different languages were spoken in Oakland. And when you have that much convergence, different cultures, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, in a very small space, get a lot of elbows thrown. Get a lot of people fighting for their quote unquote rights. You get a lot of people angry, a lot of people shooting people. Get a lot of people doing a lot of ugly things. It's not all based on ethnicity, but it's based you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a sociological lesson, but I mean you have ethnicity as one issue and then you have socioeconomic classifications and poverty. And the poverty level in California and the Bay Area is very high even though the wages are higher. Um, I won't tell, I won't bore you with that, but it, it's just, it creates a very volatile circumstance. One of the great tragedies is that the church contributes to this. We should be singing the song of the redeemed. We should be building the bridges of the redeemed. And if God allows me, I'll talk about peace and being a peacemaker. We're not peacekeepers, we're peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. 
for they'll be the sons of God. But one of the great tragedies is we have a tendency to huddle in our groups. Pentecostals do it. Evangelicals do it. Liturgicals do it. And so that's the model. And we don't understand that when Jesus created the church, if you go to that slide that shows the church, when Jesus created the church, and he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We have a tendency to not understand exactly what he was doing. The word church is in the original text is ecclesia. And, and it's been translated at times congregation or gathering. But what it literally means is called out ones. Called out ones. And the church is this incredible, mystical, mysterious, pragmatic, practical, salt and light. Body of Christ. In other words, before Jesus... From the time of Adam, and then you had Abraham, and God called out a man, Abraham, to create a nation so that he could bring forth a man, Jesus, to save the nations. So before Christ, the world was defined by the Jews, or the Israelites rather, as Israelites and Gentiles. Right? That was the tribes. The Romans did the same thing. The Romans stole from the Greeks. The, the, in, in Roman culture at the time, and, and this is the world that the New Testament is written in, you had Romans, you had Greeks, and then you had barbarians. You were either a Roman, a Greek, or a barbarian. You were just somebody else. And you had no status if you were somebody else. Right? Jews, Israelites, you were Jewish, you were of the covenant, you were part of the covenant people, or you were Gentile, you weren't. Paul comes along and he writes to uh, Gentile believers and then he makes the argument with Jewish believers in Acts 15 that you don't understand what, what this whole redemption thing is. God was making out of Jew and Gentile one new man. He was making out of the sons of Adam and the sons of, of Abraham, he was making a new race of people. And that race of people isn't defined by skin color or hair color or eye color. That race of people isn't defined by wealth and status. It's not defined by ethnicity or language. That race of people is defined By Jesus Christ. This new race of people is called Christian. Child of God. Son and daughter. They're called out from the sons of Adam. They can be of every ethnicity, of every background, of every tribe and language and people and nation. The Lord demonstrated his intention on the day of Pentecost when the first gift poured out is the gift of language and the gift of praise so that people from all over the world would hear the praises of God in their own languages. God was in the church drawing humanity unto the Christ of the church. Redemption. It's not a European gospel. It's not an American gospel. It's not an Asian gospel. It's not an African gospel. It's not an Oakland gospel. It's not an Alaskan gospel. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who died for all humanity. So that my brother, who might the world would provoke to hate me, loves me. My sister, whom the God of this age would provoke to hate me, loves me. Because I've reached into their heart and their life incarnationally. Just as Christ has done for me, I have gone and done likewise. Likewise. 
Tommy Barnett's son, Matthew Barnett, pastors the Dream Center in Los Angeles. He did one of our commencement addresses and he made a statement that struck me and broke me at the same time. Talk about building bridges. And he said the problem with seeking to be a bridge is that you have to be willing to be walked on. It's easy to be Adam coming into a perfect world. It's harder to be Jesus coming into a corrupt, broken, wicked, evil, violent place. We want to do Jesus things, don't we? Unfortunately, we want to do them when they're safe mm -hmm. and easy and quiet and peaceful. And we can sit around and we can sing Kumbaya, Lord, Kumbaya, you know. But the kingdom of God requires me to go where the broken are. To reach the wounded. To seek the hurting. To call forth life and light. To preach in the darkness. To be the church. To be the called out ones to be the body of Christ. You see, the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption, isn't just about how you get saved. It's about how God gets glorified. And God gets glorified not just in your salvation, which He certainly does, but He gets glorified when you live out your salvation in the world. Ephesians 4.1 It's in your book somewhere. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> After Paul just takes three chapters talking about what I've just taken an hour to talk about. Chapter 4 verse 1 he says this. Live a life worthy Live a life worthy. Live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Does that work, Pastor? Does that mean I, I need to get back to doing really good works? No, 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 no. How many of you love the word worship? Worship is the merging of two English terms. Worth-ship. It is the ascribing of worth. When you speak of worship, it, we, we've taken it to mean the singing of songs. No, when you speak of worship, you're, you're ascribing worth. So live a life of worship. Live a life that ascribes worth to the calling you've received. Live a life that says, I'm redeemed. I've been saved. I've been delivered. God took my sins and He threw them away. He not only declared me not guilty, but He changed me from inside and out. And I want to share with you the beauty of my salvation and the beauty of your salvation. I want to pursue you in the love of God. I want to show you the glory of Christ. I want you to understand that the God who changes my name, changed my heart, changed my mind, changed my eyes, changed my life. He changed me completely. And he's worthy of all glory and honor and praise. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Paul said, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit lives in you. So here we are now, the church of the Lord Jesus, the called out ones. You and I are an entirely new race of people. And I say that again. You and I are now an entirely new race of people. 
We're distinct and different from the sons of Adam. We stand on the horizon between heaven and earth. We are vessels of earth and yet we are filled with the glory of heaven. We speak of the eternal, the glorious, the house of our Father. We proclaim and demonstrate His rule until Jesus returns. Have you ever noticed this imagery? Have you ever noticed the miracles that Jesus did? We're going to talk about those tomorrow. Have you ever noticed some of the things the Lord did and, and why He did them? Let me give you an example. When He cast out demons, why did He do that? Because he was liberating. He was ransoming. But did he just leave the person as they were? No, he restored them to what they could be. And he released them to what they should be. When he raised the dead, why did he do it? In our Father's house, there's no death. When he cast out demons, why did he do it? In our Father's house, there's no demonic bondage. When he fed the multitude, he just gave them lunch. Why did he do it? Because in our Father's house, there's no lack. When he calmed the wind and the waves, why did he do it? Because in our Father's house, there's no violence on earth. Earth is, uh, creation is in order. When he healed the sick, why did he do it? Because in our Father's house, there's no sickness. When he forgave the sinner, why did he do it? Because in our Father's house, there's no sin. Everything Jesus did was to speak of the eternal right order of God in the earth. Do you understand? You're a window. You're a window that someone on the outside of the kingdom can look through your life and see what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. It's been said that Thomas Aquinas said this, but research shows I don't think he actually said it. But nevertheless, I'll give, I'll, give, I'll give Tom credit. It is said that he said, By all means, at all times, and on all occasions, preach the gospel. And when necessary, use words. Hmm. On all occasions and at all times and by all means, preach the gospel. And when necessary, use words. You're the church. You're blood bought. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You carry around a fallen body, but you are filled with heaven's glory. You are full of the Holy Spirit. Tonight I want to encourage you to read the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. Tomorrow we're going to talk about redemptive perspective. Perspective. I see that we have a couple minutes. Is there any questions that anyone would have? before we pray. I have answered every question in your mind. That's staggering. <laughs> I didn't have time to think about questions. You haven't had time to think about a question? <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. And you don't have to respond to me. I want you to think about it, though. Of all the challenges in the kingdom, of all the bridges that have to be built, of all the potential walking that has to be done, who is that person that is the most difficult for you to reach? Who is that person that is the most difficult for you to love? I'm not saying go to that person today. Some, frankly, shouldn't because the circumstances might be Circumstances of violence or harm. But here's the thing I want you to think about for the next couple of days. There's only one remedy for sin that has ever been given. And that's the cross of Jesus. So whether that remedy for sin is sin that I've committed or whether that is sin that has been committed against me, the only remedy is the cross of Jesus. 
We know that when we've sinned and we feel that burden of sin. And so we go to the cross and say, Lord, forgive me. The problem is, if pastor sins against me, I tend, rather than going to the cross with that sin, I try to bear that burden myself. I know I can't bear my own sin, but that's not the only kind of sin there is, is there? So when I try to bear the sins that have been committed against me myself, not only is it staggering as if I had committed it, in many ways it's worse than if I had committed it because in my absorption of that sin, I have a tendency to foster sin in my own life. I have a tendency to grow bitter, mm -hmm. to grow angry, maybe even violent, and I can justify it now. Mm -hmm. I can say things I shouldn't say. I can think things I shouldn't think. I can behave in corrupt manner. And the adversary wins. Forgiveness is never saying sin is okay. Sin has never been okay. Sin cost Jesus his life. Forgiveness is saying, I take to the cross of Calvary my sin. Lord, forgive me. It's also saying, I take to the cross of Calvary his sin against me. Lord, Forgive him. I can't bear this. Wow. You deal with him. Just as you dealt with me. So I ask you the question again. Who in your life is that person that you need to take them to the cross of Calvary and bear their sin no more? Bear their sin against you no longer. Bear their wounding. Why do we allow someone to keep wounding us over and over and over again? Because we will not let the Redeemer recover us from that. Restore us to who we should be. And let us walk free of that. Because the only remedy is the cross. And the only Redeemer is the Christ. And so when he says, forgive those who sinned against you. He's not saying, be a patsy and take it. What he's saying is be strong enough to release it. We've even misunderstood the turn the other cheek thing. That's not a passive statement. That's a statement of defiance. Someone slaps you on one cheek. You stand there. You turn to them the other. You say, you're not going to control me. I'm not giving you the power to control me. That belongs to Jesus. I joked with you before, but I mean it. I don't give people the power to insult me. I don't give them the power to offend me. You can't stop me from doing what the Lord wants me to do. I'm not going to give anybody that kind of power. Well, how does the enemy get that power? When I don't forgive. When I don't forgive. Jesus said in John 14, 30, The prince of this world is coming. He has no hold in me. When the prince of this world comes for you and I, he oftentimes has a hold. And that hold isn't the addiction. That hold isn't the lust. That hold isn't all the big stuff that we talk about. No, 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 no. That hold is usually some subtle little trace of unforgiveness. Because I haven't allowed the Redeemer to redeem all the sin in my life. I've allowed Him to redeem the sin I committed. But I didn't give Him the power to redeem or the authority, rather, to redeem the sin that's been committed against me.
because I've held on to it. Redemption is the process by which the Lord recovers, restores, and releases us to His glorious purpose so that He gets the glory and He gets the honor. And we'll talk about that as this week goes on. I love you so much. Thank you for the great privilege of being with you. God bless you. God bless you.